Good afternoon um, uh, and welcome to the Metric Europe webinar um, IG profiles for personal device interoperability. We are going to, and I think I have the uh, opportunity here now to mute everybody. Um, uh, this is a, um, a one a number three or so, or number four in a series, uh, in a loose series of Metag Europe webinars on the topic of interoperability. We're very happy to have all of you here. This is the first time that we're running this webinar on the T Microsoft Teams platform. We chose this platform because we wanted to make it extra, extra interactive, uh, but, and um, and also let let many of you participate in a chat. The downside is that you can um, unmute yourself, and we're appealing to all of you to um, to please keep yourself muted. My name is Michael Strubin, and in a moment I'm going to hand over to Alexander Eels. I work for MedTech Europe, and um, again, I would like to welcome you for this webinar. We have already many of our speakers online, um, uh, and same thing again um, uh, for in terms of practicality. So, as I just mentioned, um, we would like to ask you all to mute yourself, uh, and we will, if needed, um, uh, uh, try to identify you if there if there are issues. And this, of course, ho hopefully makes the audio quality of this call better. We would like you to stay muted. And for the comment, uh, if you have comments or uh, want, would like to ask questions during the presentations, please use the chat. Um, and there's also a raise your hand feature that we would like to ask you to use so that we can identify who wants to speak. And I believe Microsoft Teams actually ranks you in order to, of, of uh, the order by which people raise their hands. So um, uh, be quick. Um, this session will be recorded. I think we've highlighted this a couple of times. Um, so please be aware when you um, uh, want to put yourself on the record, so to speak. And of course, the slides and um, the recording will be made available to you. Um, this is the agenda of our call. I think this is consistent with um, what we communicated before. Um, uh, and in a moment, as I said, I will um, hand over to Alexander Eels. But for now, I would like to uh, start this um, host's um, privilege, so to speak, um, with uh, a few words about Metech Europe. So Metech Europe is the European Trade Association for the Medical Technology Industry, including diagnostics, medical devices, and digital health. We're based in Brussels. We have more than 130 multinational corporations as members, and we are also an umbrella group of um, 50 or more medical technology associations in European member states. And why are there more than 27? Because in many countries, A, in many countries, we have more than one member association. We have one for the IVD sector, one for the medical device sector, so to speak. And of course, we have national association, association members also outside the European Union. And of course, we also have um, member associations in the UK, which of course now is no longer a member of the, Mete of, of, of the European Union, but we have many non-EU member associations as well. Um, Metech industry in, 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 in Europe in, at a glance, I think I'm not gonna go into detail, perhaps just one thing. Um, the Metech um, industry is a very, is over a, a preponderantly a, um, an, uh, a, an SME, a small and medium size industry. 95% of all Metech uh, companies are member uh, on small and medium-sized enterprises. Not all of them, of, of course, are, met, are members of Europe of Metech Europe, but through membership in national associations, they are all part of our wider family. Uh, wider family. I'm going to leave this up here for um, for uh, for the record and for eternity. Just um, uh, highlighting a few comments on, on, on the topic of interoperability. So we, um, the, the industry, are on record um, as, uh, as agreeing with many of you, I assume, that um, lack of interoperability is a critical barrier for digital health deployment. Um, we see growing momentum for buyers and health authorities to recommend and adopt standards. Um, and Alexander, I believe, is going to talk a little bit about that changing environment, and Petra may do so as well. Um, Metech Europe founded an interoperability working group in 2018, and we've already published, and this was one of our first big achievements during my tenure here, an interoperability position paper that, is, that also calls for action on Euro EU and uh, European member states. 
Um, our current focus um, on the topic of interoperability is stakeholder engagement as well as training and education. We hope to, uh, to be in, in touch with you very soon about an exciting new publication. With that, I'd like to hand over to Alexander Eels from IHE International. Alexander, please unmute yourself and um, I see that you're already on video. Yes. Yes, thank you, Michael, very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, I would like to, to add some points uh, about the history of this event. Uh, many months ago, uh, when I served also as a member at large in the IG International Board, uh, we found there, we, we came there to the decision to, to merge uh, the things about round about uh, personal connected health alliance and uh, the um, IHE domains that are playing with these things. And um, at that time, uh, I started a discussion with Michael about how it would be to uh, present all these things, these developments in the interoperability sphere uh, around uh, the medtech things uh, to you as a community. And uh, based on that, we tried hard to organize this event uh, last year, but uh, regarding to COVID-19 and the other things, uh, it did not happen, uh, unfortunately, but now we are happy to have this event here. And uh, my only slide I show you here uh, only want to show how um, important all these things becomes now more and more in the European area. Uh, and this is the example that most of you will know from Germany, where we had now an uh, initiative, a new legislation uh, that uh, now is in place uh, and that gives you as, as vendors the possibility to design, to develop. Um, e-health applications uh, and to um, be certified as such in Germany by the BFRM uh, national authority and by uh, following the rules they give for that and one very important rule for that is here listed in the general requirements in interoperability and that's what we're talking today about and the thing is, and what is really new to this initiative, European-wide, and I think a little bit worldwide, is that if you are listed now from this organization, EFRM, you see here on the right, um, there's also a fast track for that, uh, how to become listed, then in Germany, all physicians are able to prescribe your application as a medicine to the patients. And that is really new and that hopefully gives the market a new push and that hopefully also gives the market the push in the right way so that these general requirements given here for all these applications for all these uh, DGAS as we as we uh, tell it as we call it in Germany the digital Gesundheitsanwendung uh, will become national uh, regulations and are now national regulations and especially the point interoperability uh, is on focus today. So that's all I want to say to that and I know that uh, Petra will uh, take a wider view on that on interoperability and the political requirements and the political scene on that and so I would like to hand over. I'm very happy that this uh, event now takes place and I wish you all uh, good information and a good push to the right direction to make your products, to make your service interoperable uh, using all these IHE and uh, Personal Connected Health Alliance prerequisites. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Alexander. And I think we're really good on time here when we're looking at this because we are uh, started a little bit late um, because we had to solve our, sort out some issues. Um, and um, but we're we're now here, and Alexander, I very much agree with you. This event here, this this uh, this webinar has been a long time in coming. We really wanted to do this in person at the IHE Connectors on last year, so uh, we're really glad that we're doing this now online. Um, with that, I would like to uh, invite uh, Petra Wilson to turn on her video and unmute herself. And um, I think you already unmuted. And I suggest that I keep uh, advancing the slides, Petra. I think it makes um, probably the presentation more smooth. Over Thanks. to you, Petra. Thank you, Michael. I'll, I'll just ask when I want to have the next slide then. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. It's a pleasure to see so many people who've joined us. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited actually to see the, the range of different organizations and backgrounds of the people who are here. 
you have something in common, which is that most of you actually probably know an awful lot about interoperability. So you I'm not going to spend too much time on on explaining anything about what interoperability is. What I do want to do is for us all to remember about uh, why interoperability is actually so important. The definition of interoperability that you have here on, on the slide is the definition that comes from HIMSS. And the parts that I've underlined is, is really why we have interoperability. We have interoperability so that we can cooperatively use data to optimize the health of individuals and populations globally. And that's really the key of it. And the reason I stress that is that we sometimes go into a bit of a rabbit hole and we get very caught up in the connectivity aspects of interoperability rather than interoperability that actually allows for use. And uh, my colleague Tom will talk more about that, that distinction between connectivity and interoperability. Um, but what I want to do here is remind us of the, the four levels of interoperability that exist in the European interoperability framework. Um, and for the purists among you, I, I do realise that there are two further levels when we talk about this in the healthcare domain, and I will put those up on a later slide. But I did just want to remind us that um, very often when we focus on interoperability, we focus on the technical and the semantic elements, the how do we actually get to devices or to interfaces or to pieces of software to communicate with each other. And we're sometimes a little bit more lax in thinking about the bigger organizational and legal interoperability pieces. Um, and whilst many of you on this call are more focused on the technical, and that's great, and we really need you, you need to make sure that you, um, your counterparts within the organizations and, and particularly within the legal departments of the organizations that you work um, do their part in order to translate this to the next level. And I'll just give you one quick example. Although the UK is no longer part of the European Union, um, I have happened to have a good example from them, which is the UK has had an interoperability framework for EHRs for uh, for many, many years. It actually began on this in 1998. And yet a, an, an article was published in the BMJ at the end of last year, which identified that actually um, we have uh, across uh, 540 uh, hospital trusts in the UK, we have over 70 different EHRs working. And in many cases, we don't even have interoperability from one department in a hospital to another of an EHR. And that has nothing to do with the technical capacity of the machines to talk to each other or the software to talk to each other. It's to do with the way in which the systems are organized and the legal frameworks which pertain. So I did just want to reference that. Um, next slide, please, Michael. Um, so, however, having said all that, um, the baseline of interoperability is, of course, standards, the standards that allow and drive the technical and semantic interoperability. And they've listed here, this again comes from uh, the HIMSS uh, background materials on interoperability, the areas within which interoperability is so important and where standards, uh, where we have a, a wealth of standards to help us address the interoperability uh, targets that we have. Some of them stray more into the organizational and legal aspects, for example, the privacy and security standards. But we actually still have many issues uh, in the simple vocabulary and terminology. Although the standards exist, they're not necessarily used in, in an optimal way. So while standards are, are great and uh, they are a key driver in, in, of interoperability, they are not the only tool we need. Could we have the next slide, please? And here is the more familiar version of the interoperability framework stack that you will be familiar with. Uh, this is from the eHealth Network of 2015, so it's already quite old. However, the challenges identified by the eHealth Network in 2015 still pertain. Uh, the red line across the middle of that diagram is mine, and it's where I suggest uh, above that line is where I suggest we still need the most work. We still need more focus on interoperability within care processes. 
within the policy domain and within the legal and regulatory domain. And we know, for example, that the, the Commission is making huge efforts towards this, and we are, are very encouraged by the recent publication of the um, impact, um, the inception impact assessment for the European health data space, which will really begin to drive us towards more policy and legal and regulatory uh, standardization and interoperability as we think about how data can be shared and made accessible. So come back to that first quote from what is interoperable, interoperability, how can we actually share data to make it usable? And can I have the next slide, please? However, even if we address all those challenges, we still have a lot of number of practical challenges within the health domain uh, that remain to be answered. And they are often actually really practical issues, like actually where is the data? When you have, uh, if you're treating a patient in an out outpatient clinic setting in a hospital, where is the data coming from? Have we really uh, digitized everything that we need in order to treat the patient in the smoothest way? So there remain these questions. Um, and I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that we don't want to overrun on time. So I'm not going to dig into these further. But with the next slide, what I want to highlight to you is that those date, those questions become even more complex when we then talk about the personal health domain. So whilst we have advanced quite well in driving interoperability within the health enterprise, so within hospitals and within care providers, now as we move more towards the integration of personal health services, the sort of apps that Alexander said German doctors can now prescribe, how are we going to really channel that new challenge of interoperability because we're now moving into an area where we're dealing with consumer products rather than medical grade products. We're talking about natural language and often multi languages. So um, people using multiple languages. If you just think of Belgium, where many of you are sitting, where people will be expecting to use uh, French and Dutch and probably English as well in using their apps. We're talking about many different types of data, image, text, voice and so forth. So the challenge has become much more demanding as we try to bring interoperability into the personal health domain. But uh, fortunately, my colleague Tom is going to make that all a lot more clear to us. And we're going to, uh, I hope, leave this meeting with a much clearer understanding of how IHE and HIMSS are working together to really address those challenges. And with that, I would like to end my session. The, the next slide is simply a reminder that we have a little way to go. But we have been, we have already, and we continue to take very big steps. And uh, with that, I hand back to you, Michael. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Petra. Maybe just one one minute here, uh, a comment here. Um, we all know that him, what Hims is doing in this in this uh, in this area. Um, those of us who've been there for a while know that also PCH Alliance. Uh, was a was a big player in this area, and PCH Alliance has now become a part of Hims, has been absorbed by Hims. Correct. Indeed, okay. indeed, and I think uh, I I think Tom will present that a little bit more clearly, and he will also locate for you where Continua, and some of us, some of you may knew, know us as Continua, where Continua sits within the new framework. Excellent. Thank you so much also for your discipline on time. I think by now we've fully caught up on our aspirational. Hey, we've even become better, I think, uh, in terms of our aspirational timeline. So hopefully this is going to give us some additional time for Q&A at the end. Um, you told not me 10 minutes, so I did 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we will we will come back to you if, if needed. Um, and I Thank think, um, yeah, we may not have always been fully aligned on that. Um, uh, we're all busy people and uh, this uh, we didn't even do a trial run here, um, but I think this has been really helpful. Thank you so much, Petra, and please stay on the line. Um, with that, with that, I'd like to hand over to Charles Parizeau from IEG Europe, um, and please, Charles, um, say a word or so about who you are and um, and what your role in IEG Europe is before you go into your slide deck. Thank you, and please unmute yourself and please put on your video, and I will advance your slides as you as you like. Yeah, so you should uh, hear me. Uh, do you hear me? And you should see me. Thank you. We hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, uh, uh, Petra. 
Yes, we would like to take you a little bit deeper uh, and make sure you understand um, that we are connecting uh, as well or, uh, organizations. And Aichi has been around for uh, over 20 years, 22 years now, uh, has covered a, a significant number of topics, including uh, the use of devices, but mostly in the hospital space, although some of the work um, is a little bit broader than that. Um, as we just mentioned and uh, uh, Petra mentioned, um, the uh, Continua and the Personal Connected Health Alliance, uh, the Continua being the uh, guideline, the specification, and the Connected Health Alliance being the home where that uh, specification has led so far, uh, has uh, moved a couple years back or three years back to into HIMSS. Um, and within him um, into the Accelerate Health um, Initiative. And therefore, when we uh, uh, speak of the collaboration, and I will provide you some uh, a critical element there between Aichi and the Personal Connected Health Alliance, uh, you see very well that through the Personal uh, Connected Alliance, um, we have HIMSS uh, uh, supporting this effort. Um, HIMSS is also a key member uh, of Aichi, actually a founding member and a sponsor uh, of Aichi. So there is a lot of connection and there have been a lot of connection for a, a fair amount of time uh, between those organizations. We have a history of collaboration between Aichi um, and Continua and the Personal C Connected Health Alliance uh, that is, uh, you know, probably more than 10 years long. Next slide, please. So back late in 19, in 2019, uh, the IG board and the PCHIS board says, hey, why don't we explore a much closer relationship and developing a, 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 a common vision, something that could uh, make us uh, uh, more efficient, more collaborative, um, and provide more clarity uh, to uh, uh, folks that are implementing in the market and deploying a, a system in uh, in supporting uh, care as well as supporting uh, the citizen as patients. Next slide, please. So there were uh, in this collaboration uh, agreement uh, the idea to accelerate uh, accelerate a number of things as I mentioned and to uh, make sure we had a, a good strategy uh, and uh, that uh, was actually an improved strategy. And the, the idea of saying, hey, interoperability is complex and interoperability needs to be addressed in a consistent way across a number of uh, environment and therefore the breadth of integration and having a, a broader scope will only help uh, making uh, uh, progress, and we will show you how this is happening. Next slide, please. So there were a pretty broad range of topics that uh, were put in uh, by the two boards on uh, the uh, horizon and says, hey, let's do a, a good review of uh, uh, what we've done, uh, both on the marketing side, on the technical side, um, on the conformity assessment, how do we test and support events that are promoting and educating on testing um, and move uh, move forward. Next. And that resulted into uh, uh, identifying a number of pain points, things that we're not doing well enough and that we're, uh, we wanted to uh, strengthen uh, and use a collaboration um, to have a clear market communication. And as explained uh, by Michael, those efforts uh, were moving uh, fairly well in the early part of 2020 and have been uh, disrupted. And we are very happy to, in a sense, resume um, those type of effort uh, 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 now that the horizon is, uh, <clears throat> is getting uh, much clearer. Uh, we wanted to continue to uh, uh, deliver effective solution, good testing, good specification, 
um, avoid the perception of competition because they, they, uh, uh, people easily think that uh, uh, those organizations are competing, which was not the case, but we needed to make that uh, clear um, and provide a good testing and tooling environment and even better one than uh, the one in which uh, uh, both uh, the uh, Personal Care Alliance um, and IG had invested in for uh, several years. Next slide. So the view uh, taken from the uh, uh, personal health uh, uh, device world, where uh, uh, for many years centered on the Continua and their design guideline, um, and that uh, required and uh, was uh, supported with a number of collaboration with uh, uh, standards and other body, and one of them, of course, um, was Aichi, uh, but there was also HL7, there was also Bluetooth uh, in the International um, uh, Electro Electronic Commission, IEEE, and, and so forth. Um, what was interesting is that um, in the collaboration with Aichi, uh, if you look at the Continua uh, design guidelines, you will see uh, a number of Aichi profiles. I believe there are five profiles from Aichi uh, that have been referenced and reused by Continua. And those were profiles initially designed for within the hospital, uh, but Aichi was very careful to design them in a way that they could be used also outside of the hospital, although that was not clear, and that was made quite clear by Continua. So we have been working at keeping consistency between the two. But the new view now that we have put in place um, is in a sense to flip uh, uh, things around. Next slide, please. And to uh, uh, basically say, hey, uh, Continua would like to be, uh, and the Personal Care, uh, 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 Care Alliance would like to be uh, a facilitator, a, a driver, and push some of its technical work uh, uh, into Aichi and join uh, the Aichi uh, device domain. And this is something that uh, Tom um, will uh, describe in further detail uh, right uh, after me. Yes, uh, let's uh, say that uh, that first phase of the mission uh, has been accomplished. We now uh, have a much better understanding of the market. We have done some uh, uh, mapping, even some uh, profile, a uh, personal device observation upload profile in trial implementation um, has been released. Trial implementation mean in the IG uh, process that the spec is over, that the use case is well understood. However, it needs to be tested and it needs to be uh, deployed in the real world. And we know very well uh, and this is one of the uh, strengths of IG, which is to say uh, it's not only about picking standards, but it's operationalizing those standards, making sure they are testable, that the use case is well understood by the implementers and by the uh, people that are deploying those uh, uh, device and systems, um, and therefore making sure that we bridge uh, the deployment space uh, with the standard space, and that's where IG um, has its uh, has strength. So in a sense, an IG profile um, uh, is a kind of a standard, but it's a, in a sense a meta standard. It's assembling uh, several standards and providing a test environment and a number of things um, to make uh, the, the uh, uh, interability uh, actually much more uh, operational. In terms of test process and tool, uh, we are in the process to develop an integration between the two test tools, leveraging their respective strength. And this will be uh, visible uh, early March in the uh, uh, US uh, uh, IG Connectathon, uh, the North American one, early the first week of March, and also deployed in Europe uh, uh, during the uh, June. Uh, IG Europe uh, Connectathon. So if you want to uh, benefit from that testing and experience and uh, use that new testing platform, we really invite you to either join in March the US 
uh, connectothon or the uh, June European uh, uh, connectothon. We've also uh, started effort in joining our conformity assessment scheme. Uh, both IG and Continua had a slightly different scheme, uh, but there have been a number of efforts to align them and make it make things less confusing and clear um, uh, to the uh, implementers, the uh, the ones that are releasing product and also acquiring product, and we need uh, that uh, conformity assessment. And explaining this uh, is indeed uh, something that is being done that we definitely need to do more of, but that is well on its way. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, a few resources uh, on the marketing side, if you want to understand uh, a little bit better the joint vision of PCHA and, uh, and, uh, uh, and IHE, um, and uh, how we would like uh, 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 global standards to become more operational uh, through that joint effort, uh, I invite you to access uh, those uh, those resources. Uh, I unfortunately do not have enough time to cover them, but you've had uh, the generic picture there uh, in those slides. Next, please. So let's move a little bit uh, 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 in a sense to the past. It's important to understand what has been achieved so that we can build trust on what will be achieved. Uh, and uh, the realization uh, in the early 2000 um, was that uh, uh, hospital and the, the way hospi uh, hospital were managing their devices uh, was needing a, a, a level of interoperability and of integration that was not uh, available. Uh, and that was having a number of uh, 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 raising a number of issues, uh, even to the point that some hospital uh, and especially in Europe were in a sense cautious bringing uh, device data into my uh, medical record. Oh, no, 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 that medical device is too, uh, too brittle. I will leave that at the departmental level. And we are seeing this uh, changing and we've seen that change and it is now very clear that integrating medical device into the patient record uh, is becoming a, uh, a, a critical need. Uh, it automates, it increases productivity, it, it makes it uh, more safer, uh, provide a broader view and a more proactive view of delivering uh, uh, a clinical care. So we uh, foresaw that and we can say, hey, this has been accomplished, this is available today, and I want in a few slides show you what has been done uh, over the past few years and what is the benefit within the hospital world uh, in terms of device interoperability. Uh, some of you are in those markets. Next slide. So the uh, key profile, this is not the complete list, but uh, those are the most widely adopted and recognized uh, profile. Uh, uh, for device integration in hospital. And I will uh, uh, speak uh, to the first two a little bit deeper um, to give you a sense, but I encourage you to uh, access the IG technical framework, uh, the patient care device technical framework, which is on the IG website uh, to understand better what those other profile are. All of those are implemented, they are tested, they are testing tool, uh, and they are broad. The enterprise sharing of patient care data um, is covering way more than 300 type of hospital device measurement in a standardized uh, way, and I will explain to you how this works. Next. So yes, uh, reporting device data is probably the first step that is being looked at in uh, uh, moving data, health data out of the device uh, uh, into the uh, medical uh, medical record. And this applies for health rate measurement, for infusion pump uh, volume and, uh, and output and, uh, and so forth. And what IG has done uh, is develop a profile called DEC device to enterprise communication. Uh, it is based on HL7 V2 and yes, there is work to also provide an HL7 fire uh, version. Uh, but I want to remind you that HL7 V2 is effective today as all of the testing tool, uh, and it's actually a very, very uh, 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 performance 
uh, related uh, format, it's actually higher performance uh, than uh, FAR is. Less, uh, less transmission overhead in the way it has been, um, it has been integrated. So we are um, having a, a, a solid basis here, and it covers not only the transmission, but it covers also the semantic and the um, and the nomenclature. And this is one of the profile that the Continua Design Guideline has uh, leveraged. Next. So if we want to see a little bit better what this uh, profile does, we have on one side uh, an abstraction of the device and uh, Aichi does not, um, I would say, worry about the device itself, but it says, hey, if you want to communicate, uh, we're going to create something that we call an actor, an Aichi profile actor, and that's a device observation reporter. And when you support this actor, within an IG profile, there are a number of transactions that you need to support. And for the deck profile, if you are a device observation reporter of the IG deck profile, you have to support this patient care device 01 uh, transaction. And that transaction can allow you to feed directly um, into a device observation consumer, which is the kind of abstraction of an EMR, of a clinical information system or research system uh, or whatever you want to do. And we see that an intermediate actor has also been introduced uh, to filter the data and to configure that filter using the PCD02 transaction. So in Continua, PCD01 has been integrated, uh, but the device filter is actually uh, not relevant, but it is quite relevant in, uh, in acute care uh, setting uh, in, uh, in hospitals. Next. So those were the transactions and the uh, moving of information, but the, the semantic is also quite important. And IG has been uh, collaborating with uh, IEEE on uh, uh, the uh, terms and how to uh, encode the measurements, the units of the measurements, and the contextual information about those measurements. And the way it was approached by IG is again very pragmatic, and this is why this terminology is a, a terminology anchored in reality. What we did uh, over the past few years is to actually work with the willing vendors, and there were many of them, that said, hey, these are the terms that my device are providing to label uh, their measurements. And from those, uh, we created a list of harmonized terms uh, in collaboration with IEEE, and it's actually published in the IEEE 11073 uh, uh, standard, the terminology part. Um, and we call this a, a mapping of the real world into uh, another real world, which is, however, a vendor independent way to label the measurements and to express uh, units and so forth. And then those uh, encoded measurements can be transmitted in V2, in V3, uh, in FIRE, uh, or even in the uh, uh, 11073 uh, original uh, standard. So, this is uh, a piece of work which is very mature and that is delivering uh, a lot of terms. I said over uh, 300 and I think it's more like uh, 600. Um, there is not a single thing that I know of that can be measured by a device uh, which doesn't has a term uh, in this Rosetta uh, terminology mapping. It is online and accessible uh, and uh, uh, provide, uh, uh, we have a partnership with the National Institute of Science and Technology in the US who is uh, hosting this with an agreement with IEEE. So this is free. Uh, this is available online and make uh, uh, the transmission of the data very efficient and very uh, standardized in a device neutral way. Uh, so that the maximum number of EMR can use the same uh, uh, interface in that DEC uh, transaction to import that data. Next. So we will not go through that, but you see here that we have a, uh, uh, an example of a, uh, of a patient monitor that delivers a lot of measurements, uh, heart rate, volume uh, of, uh, of various kinds, and those measurements are 
simply expressed. They are coded. You know exactly what it is. You know the unit uh, of that measurement. Um, and the data structure, which is defined here, is based on HL7 uh, v2.6, uh, um, but it is also uh, defined in a very precise way um, into the IG profile. And this is what the IG profile are bringing, and what Tom will explain to you further um, is making the standard actionable, implementable, testable, and deployable. And this is why we are very happy to contribute and to uh, have uh, personal devices addressed in the context of IG, thanks to the support uh, of the uh, of the PCHA. Thank you very much. Oh, we spoke about the testing. Sorry, forgetting one mm -hmm. slide. <laughs> uh, those test tools are also available. They are, as I said, uh, 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 integrated and used with the Gazelle. Uh, you, we even have a conformity assessment program that allows you uh, to test this PCD01 transaction uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, contact uh, uh, me and Aichi and uh, we will uh, help you and answer further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, very much. I, we've consumed now, if we're looking at, at our agenda, we've, we've, uh, we've consumed now the couple of minutes that Petra gave us and eaten just a little bit into Tom's, but of course, um, um, hopefully we, um, we, can, we can catch up and of course, um, uh, uh, we will also see whether we can, con uh, we can uh, come back to some of your items uh, in the Q&A. Please stay on the line. I would now like to hand over to um, Tom Erickson, who will discuss um, the, the more details of the merger between uh, the PCH Alliance, now HIMSS and, and IHE a little bit further. And um, we gave you extra time, Tom. Let's see how you make use of your time with that. Um, Tom, it's so great to have you. Tom is joining us from... Um, from, from the middle of the United States. Um, it's early there. Thanks very much for making the time. Tom? All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm Tom Erickson and I'm with, uh, with HIMSS and uh, I'm Director of Technical Operations. And I like to think my role is to translate all these uh, standards and profiles, uh, um, ideas and concepts into real world deployments. So that's always my objective. I always look at everything and say, what do we need to do for this to be adopted in the market? And IHE and PCH Alliance and, and MS are doing a great job of developing all this technology, as, as Charles just pointed out, in some detail. We, By and large, we have the syntactic, technical, and semantic uh, standards nailed down. But as Petra pointed out, th there's a whole lot more to the interoperability solution than that. And one of the things I, I, I'm working on this year is, you know, we need to help the people that help the people, our target audience, understand in practical terms what these standards and, and profiles do. And the, the pandemic has, has created an opportunity to do that. Uh, as we know, this, this pandemic spread very rapidly, uh, very quickly. Tens of millions of people were infected. Uh, millions of people have passed from it. And it just it moved very quickly. And people were in kind of a panic. They said, oh, the instant they started getting sick, they dashed to the hospital saying, hey, do I have COVID? Am I going to die? And as a result, the, the, the hospitals got quickly overwhelmed. Uh, the beds were consumed. Uh, the resources were consumed. And so this is an opportunity to say in very practical, practical terms, if we had remote patient monitoring uh, and people had the, the right tools at home, they could monitor themselves and overcome their anxiety. If they were a little bit short notes of breath, they could determine that's not due to COVID, it's due to anxiety, that type of thing. And when they got to the hospital, they wouldn't have to go in, into in the mainstream flow. They could be uh, monitored at the hospital remotely again. Uh, so uh, nurses didn't have to don and off PPE all the time. And once the situation did in, indeed require medical intervention, they were only seconds away. There's hundreds of millions of devices that are uh, out in the market today, but the vast majority of them have what I call entertainment grade data. They don't have the exhaustive uh, provenance that, that Charles just outlined, basically send a weight measurement or a, a, a heart rate or whatever. And while it's great for, for the consumer level, it falls far short of what the clinician needs to make a, a clinical decision. And so, we have these hundreds of millions of devices out there, and they all have these proprietary uh, connectivity. And if you really want to make uh, a tool set available to, to monitor pandemic symptoms, 
you really need to have uh, interoperability. And a key uh, key element of that that solution is when you receive a measurement, you know, you need to know what, why, where, and how that that measurement received. The next slide. So it's important to help everybody understand the difference between connectivity and interoperability. Uh, early on, a lot of the leading health, uh, leading uh, tech companies provided uh, entered the healthcare IT space using proprietary solutions, and that was es essential to, to quickly move into that space. But it's all proprietary, and it really doesn't scale, uh, or is very costly to scale. If you really want to handle a, a global pandemic, you need a way to quickly produce billions of sensors. And these sensors, whoever makes them, they need to automatically communicate with whatever electronic health record system in whatever hospital, in whatever country, anywhere around the world. In order to do that, you really need what we call interoperability. Connectivity is a proprietary API or even an open API, but yet there's still, you have to implement them for every device, uh, device by device, system by system. Interoperability is we have one agreed upon API that everybody uses so that devices automatically can communicate with each other. Next slide. So, you know, people say, well, can you do that? All we have to do is look at, we're doing it every day. When you send a text message or an email from one trusted person to the next, that works. We have this system in place, whether you have an iPhone or an Android phone or, or smartphone or flip phone or whatever, they, they, they can communicate. And the reason that happens is, we've, is the industry got together and said, hey, let's agree on a specific set of standards, a specific, specific set of mechanisms that will enable this exchange of information. The same concept can be used with, with healthcare devices. So at the end of the day, an individual can, can choose their own device to collect their health data and share it with their doctor uh, in their hospital. Next slide. So 10 plus years ago, the Personal Connected Health Alliance uh, said, okay, we have all these great standards out there. The key to interoperability is uniform implementation of those standards. We came up with the continued design guidelines, focusing not so much on the devices themselves, but the interfaces between those devices. You can leave, leave it up to the domain experts to have the functionality of the device. But when it comes to communicating that, there needs to be uniform implementation of that. So we adopted the IEEE 11073 family standards that tells you very specifically what, why, where, and how things were measured, and that very and that includes sufficient information to make clinical decisions. And to make sure that that information was not lost as it went to the electronic health record system, we came up with another interface called the services interface that leverages HL7 standards and IHE profiles and IEEE standards and web standards and so forth that says, okay, now that we have this, this data, how do we actually package it up and transmit it to a health, a health record system or, or to a, a health and fitness service? And once it's there, if it has to go to a specific health information system, you know, what, what standards and how do we implement those standards to do that? And if you really want to dive into the details, there's a link there to uh, the ITU their recommendation is based on the continued design guidelines. Next question, or next slide. <laughs> so um, as Charles pointed out, continue, the Personal Connect Health Alliance has this, this great solution. IHE has some great solutions. We need to work together, remove some of the fragmentation that's in the marketplace, minimal, reduce some of the confusion on, okay, what standards do I use? What profiles do I use? So the Personal Connect Health Alliance said, you know what? Why don't we move our, our technical de development work in profile development into IHE? So while the Personal Connected Health Alliance still exists and pursues other, other uh, challenges in remote patient monitoring and connected care, the technical elements are now part of the uh, integrated healthcare enterprise. And uh, the devices domain was formed within IHE. And what was the Personal Connected Devices domain became one of three key programs within the new devices domain. And Charles already gave you a pretty good idea of, of what uh, is included in that program. Another program that was being developed about the same time as this alignment effort was underway uh, focused more on high acuity devices. So that became another key program under the devices domain in that uh, the device point of care interoperability program. And then uh, the, the work that was done under the Personal Connect Health Alliance uh, became the Personal Connect to Health program. And that's really working on, on harmonizing the, the, 
the uh, standards used, whether the device is used remotely or in the hospital, so that it could be a seamless integration. So somebody can start with the device at home, monitoring the situation, move to the hospital, continue that, using that device, and that device will automatically communicate with uh, whatever system the hospital is using. Next slide. So out of that aligned effort, the first profile that came about was the personal health device observation upload. And what this profile does is basically it collects those IEEE observations, maps those into fire resources, and then delivers them up to a fire server. Uh, and so that greatly simplifies, you know, if somebody has, uh, wants to have their device connect to a, a, somebody else's health record system, they don't have to go digest all the different standards and come up with their own implementation that may or may not be interoperable with another device, with another system. They can use this profile to, to accomplish that. Next slide. So a little, a little bit more detail on what happens in that profile. Just again, it uses the IEEE 11073 standard, which you know, has a number of parameters, but basically there's two key parts of it. There's medical device system object, which tells you, okay, this is it's this type of device. It's manufactured by this person, and it has this. It was calibrated and it, and meets these regulatory requirements. And then there's the metric object. This is okay. It's a it's a blood pressure measurement or a pulse oximetry measurement or a temperature measurement. So that's the information that's collected uh, uh, and mapped into fire. Next slide. So it's a key to this, the IEEE standard is, is this concept of gen being generic. So we, there's a generic, generic structure that says, okay, there's a nomenclature code that says, this is the information that you're gonna receive. In that, and then you're also gonna get this value and it's gonna be, have these, these units and it's gonna be taken at this time. Now that same data structure can be used whether you're sending a temperature measurement or a weight measurement or a blood pressure measurement or whatever. So this just gives you an example of how you can use that generic structure to, to communi very, communicate very specific uh, information. The, the, the nice thing about that is, is we've developed a, uh, a mapping that goes from this generic structure into a VIRE profile. So there's a standard, there's a uh, implementation guide within HL7 that says, okay, you have these IEEE 11073 measurements. This is exactly how you map them into the fire uh, device resource, and then that resource can be uploaded. Next slide. So uh, the, the measurements are collected in the gateway, and now you have to upload them to a, to a fire server. First thing you want to do is make sure that this, the fire server is, is ready for your capability. And then you want, the fire server wants to make sure that the, the, they understand the capability of the device. Once you've, once you've agreed that you do have compatible cap capability, you want to make sure that you're authorized to receive that data. So that you need to have an, a, a procedure that automatically goes out to a no-auth server to make sure that uh, the parties are, are properly authorized. And then we've developed uh, two types of uploads. One is you can upload an entire bundle that's self-contained and that has all the information needed. Uh, and then that can be passed through to uh, uh, another entity. Or if, uh, if, the, if the server itself can maintain persistence, then all you really have to do is send the change data. And that's uh, important for more efficient use of, uh, of the bandwidth. Uh, next slide. So I really want to emphasize and something that's lost quite frequently when we talk about these profiles and standards is this concept of generic. And while people look at IEEE 11073 and say, that's kind of complicated, I really don't have the domain expertise, our, our, our expertise is on the device itself and not the interfaces. Uh, so they, they, it's hard for them to, to put the time and justify the time and energy to, to make, develop that interface. Well, what a lot of people don't realize is it's set up to be generic. So you can put that time and energy into building your, your receiver once, and it will automatically read the data from any IEEE level 73 uh, compliant device. The key thing is it works for new devices in the future that have yet to be defined, because these new devices, as long as they find, follow that standard, your, your receiver, your gateway, your, your server, your health and fitness server will automatically receive that without doing a software update or hardware, hardware update or anything. So your cost of uh, continuing operations is dramatically reduced. Next slide. So as I mentioned, uh, a lot of people say, hey, this 11.73 is a great idea, but it, it's just too complicated. 
Uh, I often don't need a lot of what's involved in there, but yet I need to make sure that I'm compatible with that. So it's fairly uh, extensive uh, design process. So recognizing that, we said, you know what, let's simplify this. Now that the 1173 has been out there for a number of years, uh, what are people really using? Uh, and what, what are they not using? And one of the f- key c- feedback came from the market was, you know what, let's first separate the information model from the transport. Because we may already have, a, for example, a Bluetooth transport that we already want to use, and we don't want it to support another transport. The other is there's a, so many uh attributes that just aren't used and aren't necessary even to make clinical decisions. Let's take those out of the out of the specification. And, we're, and right now we're currently developing what we call a con- abstract content information model and that's uh, undergoing development in the IEEE. And as I mentioned, you know, uh, they may not want to use the the optimized exchange protocol that's defined in the IEEE. Uh, a very popular transport is Bluetooth. So we're also working with uh, Bluetooth SIG to develop what we're calling a generic health sensor. And the generic uh, advantages that I just mentioned for IEEE, we're bringing those to the, to the Bluetooth so that they can uh, transport the information, abstract information content over a Bluetooth low energy uh, to a, a, a health observation server. Uh, in parallel with that, uh, a lot of people say, you know, by the time I collect the devices, I have to have a certain gateway and it gets complicated. I have to pair them. And there's a lot of times I don't really have the luxury of having a gateway. So uh, we want the sensors to communicate directly to the cloud. Uh, and a lot of the sensors, they want to be as small as possible. They want uh, uh, a lifetime, a long battery life. So what we need to do is make sure that we really communicate just the information that's needed to make a clinical decision. So we're developing what we call a direct-to-cloud constrained device implementation guide, and that work is uh, is just getting underway. Okay. Next slide. So we have all the standards. We have these implementation profiles that allow you to implement those in uniform fashion. Uh, and we have test uh, platforms to make sure you've done that correctly. But again, these companies need this domain expertise to digest the standards, to digest the profiles, to create the software, to integrate that software with their product. Um, so we took it a step further. Uh, the Personal Connected Health Alliance has developed uh, software, commercial ready software, that actually does this. It, it implements the profile. So you, it's a, basically a software library that you can load into your product. Uh, make sure that it, it works per the standard and you're off and running. And while we we like to go out there and champion the world, hey, we got this great software that does this. At the end of the day, the people that we envision using this don't care. They don't care about the technology. They don't care about the standards, the profiles. What they care about is what does it do for me? And so what we're trying to do is say, you know, at the end of the day, what this does for you is it reduces patient's anxiety because you can do this monitoring at home. Uh, you can do the monitoring, for example, you can do the monitoring in the hospital, so the, the staff remains safe, safe during a pandemic. Uh, you, you conserve those resources for people that really need them, and it really has the potential to save a number of lives. And with this software, it makes it a lot sim- more simple and a lot quicker to implement those uh, those guidelines. And, the, and a huge plus is with that one uniform open API, you have global scale. You can have hundreds of vendors developing hundreds of, or dozens of vendors developing hundreds of devices uh, by the millions, and they all should just work together. And as I mentioned, uh, and I will elaborate a little bit in a minute, is there's a test framework to make sure that you do, did everything correctly. So that software is available uh, for people interested. Next slide. So what, what does that really do? It's it's a software that has the end to end from the uh, from the device itself to a gateway if it needs to go through a gateway to a server to an app. Um, the 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 package really has it has a simulator, so you can simulate existing or future devices to make sure that you know you can actually give it a run and make sure that it works. Uh, there's also a feature that links proprietary devices. So even though devices may have proprietary uh, data structures, we can map those into the standards. And therefore, this it, it enters the standards-based ecosystem. Um, and as I mentioned, the software simplifies and accelerates the adoption. We discovered a number of Bluetooth 
interoperability issues. Whenever we have plug fest, uh, most of the challenges are just getting the Bluetooth to work properly, and those are being addressed with the software. And at the end of the day, what all this is designed to do is to improve staff workflows. Um, and we also develop it to, uh, to industry standards. We have uh, uh, software quality standards, and that's the purpose of that is to streamline regulatory approval. We envision that this software eventually is going to go into the open source community because there's a number of people out there that we know can help uh, improve that. Uh, so that's envisioned. If you want to see more about what that uh, software does, there's a, there's a link embedded uh, um, in, the, in the slide. Next slide, please. So as Charles mentioned, we have uh, uh, conforming, conforming assessment schemes. IEG had a great one. They had a, have a method for authorizing test lab to make sure that they have the expertise and the equipment uh, to do uh, to do the testing. They have another uh, procedure that makes sure that they have they all use uniform test methods. So uh, you have uniform a dem method and dem way of demonstrating that your product does indeed meet the meet the standards and will be interoperable. Uh, as you mentioned, the personal product health lines had the same type of thing. Uh, it goes one step further for those vendors whose customers want a third party to, you know, put it, declare that yes, it is does indeed conform to the standards. Uh, personal Connect Alliance has that uh, as well. Next slide. Uh, as mentioned, we're uh, we're integrating the continue test tool with the IHG tool suite. Uh, the first. Uh, first step was to make sure that you can actually use the Gazelle platform, which is used in IHG Connectathons, to uh, interface with the continuous test tool. Uh, that first profile we developed, the observation upload profile, is now supported by the test tool with a release that just came out uh, within the last couple of weeks. Um, and uh, we're we're not we're now working to evolve it to make sure that we uh, adequately support uh, Connectathons in the cloud. Uh, next slide. So there's ways to uh, for you to gain confidence that your product works as advertised. So again, we have this continued test tool, which is designed more to demonstrate compliance to the standard. Two ways you can do that. You can download it for free and run it in your own lab, uh, run their tests, and declare directly to your customer that you are compliant with these standards. Or if your customer requires that third-party certification, you can go to a recognized test lab and have that done. Um, we also have these connectathons where you can get together with uh, you know, a number of vendors with a number of systems and actually demonstrate and prove to yourself that it, it really works. You can really communicate data uh, between your device and, and any other uh, vendor. Next slide. So as, as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is shift a little bit more towards identifying the value of all this. Uh, we get excited and go out there and talk all the techie techie stuff and say this is great, and it is. But uh, people don't understand, can't automatically map in their mind how that translates into something that solves their problems on a, on a daily basis. So that's kind of where we're at. We're reaching out to various stakeholders, describing our products, what we think the benefits and features are, make sure that they match what the customers' wants and needs are and what, uh, what challenges they have. And then it's important to help them understand that while there's a number of devices out there that provide connectivity, um, this this open standards based solution uh, really supports interoperability and what the difference is between those two. Next slide. So uh, there's a blog series uh, that was written uh, about six months ago that really kind of walk you through uh, what remote remote patient monitoring can do for you, how it reduces uh, anxiety, increases patient uh, or staff safety. Uh, the fact that you can use your own device to communicate your own data to your own doctor, uh, and then how, you know, if you're a product manager, how do you go about actually implementing that? And then how do you demonstrate that you've done it correctly and the software that help, you know, speed that along? Um, and, and again, another link to that uh, description of the software that implements these, these profiles. Next slide. So I guess we're moving on to Q&A. Four minutes to spare. <laughs> and with thank that, you for your time. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Tom. I think this has been great. Um, I think you've done you've been 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 better and faster than 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 you thought. Um, but that, of course, gives you now a chance. Gives us now a chance to um, engage more in questions. 
Um, I saw in the chat uh, not a whole lot of activity, but I would like to recognize um, Marta, who is uh, the Metag Europe Digital Health Committee Vice Chair, and in the sense the senior representative of our of our um, of our membership. Um, Marta, would you please like to um, ask your question in person? And I think you can unmute yourself. Yes, uh, I'll thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, uh, Tom, and, and all the panelists uh, for agreeing and being here, giving us this wonderful um, uh, webinar. The presentations are very good. Thank you for the high level uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, thank also to all the participants, to, to all the attendees that made time in their busy agenda to attend this, this webinar. Um, my question uh, was more, uh, as I'm fanatic of cybersecurity, <laughs> and more in, in, in terms of uh, if the, uh, the uh, IG profiles um, uh, conform uh, aspects on security for the sensors. Uh, I, I know that the IEEE a point of contact working group as well is, is working on some aspects uh, on this, but uh, I would like the, that Tom can can clarify this. Tom, Tom or, or, or uh, any other of the panelists, right? Sure, that, that's a really good question, and, and security is is always becoming more and more uh, aware, more and more aware of the need for that. Uh, the IEEE does have a number of profiles that address privacy and security, uh, and, and we do uh, incorporate those. But uh, a lot of, uh, in the remote space, we've been also focusing more on the device security and privacy, and the IEEE uh, developed a white paper not too long ago kind of outlining what, what really needs to be done for that security, not only for the upload of observation, but also for the command and control of devices remotely. And it looks like Charles uh, wants to add something about the IEG work in this space. So. Charles, you are on mute. Yep. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Tom. Uh, th there is a, a, a piece of work that IT has done, which is uh, uh, widely used uh, in many uh, EL settings, um, which is called uh, ATNA, which is Audit Trail and Node Authentication, ATNA for those who love acronyms. Uh, and uh, uh, that profile is a both a, a, a pretty simple profile, but put uh, Put things in, uh, I would say, in a very clear perspective. Um, it includes the audit trail component um, and provides you with a format uh, to uh, uh, make a record of those audit trail with the elements uh, that need to be in the audit trail. If you want to send this audit trail somewhere or store it locally, uh, that's um, uh, a choice that the profile leaves open. Um, and the other thing that it does is a node authentication. Uh, it relies very simply on uh, TLS, um, which is an improved version of SSL um, that uh, uses uh, two certificate, um, one for each end of the communication and uh, allows therefore to encrypt the communication. And many people are familiar with the TLS um, uh, uh, standard. Um, it has the merit of uh, structuring and it uh, recently released a, a new, uh, I would say, packaging that highlight a number of options and align with the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force um, BCP 195. So uh, all of the most recent requirement on cyber protection are uh, actually covered. Uh, listing uh, the the five cipher that BCP 195 recommends. So if you want to 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 secure the link and uh, and put in place a necessary audit trailing, I think Atna is a good starting point, and I think it is also used uh, by the Continua uh, design uh, guidelines. Yes, it is. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, uh, there are a couple of more. I was just going to uh, make good on my threat and ask questions myself, but there are now others. Um, I think Sabine is uh, is asking a question. Sabine, would you like to unmute or should would you like me to paraphrase your question? Sure, I can try to. Sabine is our mm -hmm. vice chair of the uh, interoperability working group from our member company Roche. Sabine. Thanks for the great presentation. So the, the question is going to Tom. 
and the one open API for global scale. So is it really that open that no rules and requirements are needed that you can send data regardless what kind of format? That would I was be curious in because usually you can also say this and that format is allowed to send. Could you elaborate on that? Or is that too dangerous? Certainly. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's the technical uh, level is where this works, is if uh, your device manufacturer, a gateway manufacturer, or a server manufacturer, if you Im implement these profiles, then any device that implements those profiles and has you know demonstrated its conformance, it will automatically communicate. So from a technical mm -hmm. syntactic uh, perspective, it works. Now, if there's some other uh, higher level policy or regulatory requirements that are that uh, are at play, uh, that's uh, over and above what the IHE profile addresses. Thanks a lot. Excellent, thank you. I see a raised hand from Tommaso Pachi. I hope I got that pronunciation right because I don't think I know you, Tommaso. Uh, please uh, raise your question. Hi. Uh, hi, everybody. <laughs> First of all, thank you for this. It uh, was a very good meeting, interesting meeting, uh, very good initiatives. Um, my question is in relation to the Rosetta initiative and how does it refer or compare to what uh, other data dictionary standards, such as LOINC and SNOM CT, as these are quietly, uh, widely adopted by FIRE. Is it like Rosetta including? such dictionaries or is it working together with them or is it like something in alternative to them? Thank you. Uh, maybe I can try to answer that one. Um, so the world of terminology is quite complex. If you look at Loink and SNOMED, uh, they are essentially intended uh, uh, to cover element of the patient record uh, in the patient record. And the IEEE uh, 1073 terminology, uh, that is an established standard, has a slightly different purpose in a sense that it's trying to define the terms that are associated with a device produced measurement um, in a certain context with a certain semantic um, and in a certain grouping with potentially other measurements that have been taken uh, at the same time or by the same device. So in a sense, the Rosetta Stone, which is based on the IEEE terminology, is the device-centric part of the terminology. That terminology that is associated with the measurements are moved to the EMR, and they need to be interpreted with the EMR and map in such a way of form, potentially to some LOINC or some uh, uh, SNOMED measurement. But there is a many to one mapping, if you want, uh, when you move into the EMR. Uh, both SNOMED and LOINC, um, I'm not speaking of LOINC for uh, uh, lab here, uh, but is not sufficiently precise uh, to have the uh, a description of the measurement on the device. This is why those terminologies will coexist and need to coexist uh, with an interpretation at the uh, EMR level. Okay, thank you very much. It's clear. Excellent, thank you. Um, in the absence of other questions, I'd like to not have this this um, this conversation, this webinar close with a with what is what is just a techie shop talk. Although there are many other questions, and um, of course, um, uh, Charles and and uh, uh, Tom, you've you've made many additional resources available. I'd like to bring back um, Alexander and Petra into this conversation and look at the wider environment in which we're operating. Um, Alexander, um, at the beginning of the um, conversation, you mentioned, um, uh, of course, um, how these uh, uh, standards and, and IEG profiles are becoming relevant um, in Germany and other countries, particularly through the reimbursement route. Um, I read recently that the German government has also now passed a, a, a massive hospital investment program that also uh, makes more um, uh, requirements for interoperability mandatory. Is that something that, um, that, that you can say a little bit more about? Can or am I putting you on the spot? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you, Alexander. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, uh, the thing is that uh, the initiative you mentioned um, is really a, a huge initiative. We are talking about 4 billion uh, euros, uh, but the problem is uh, there is no uh, incentive for interoperability. Interoperability is, on the other hand, uh, a requirement to offer things for these initiatives. The concept and, uh, of the initiative and the incentive uh, model is very complex. To, be, to, to describe it, in, uh, I try it in one sentence. Uh, the hospitals have to um, make suggestions to their countries, the countries then to the federal organization. After three months, they get uh, a decision about the reimbursement and then they start tendering all these things. So we talk about a time frame where we think in Germany that mid of the year, uh, earliest, better, uh, the, the third or fourth quarter of the year, we will see a lot of tenders. And um, in the, the whole system, there are 11 um, specialties. And uh, in two of them, interoperability of uh, devices uh, are playing a role. But there are no hard uh, regulations or, or specifications what kind of interoperability they have to do. Uh, there are uh, uh, very soft uh, hints to the German directory of interoperability where uh, Vesta, where all German belonging interoperability and standards like also PCHA and other things are listed. Uh, but there is no hard incentive uh, for these things. Okay, that's really helpful to know. Thank you, Alexander. And sorry if I put you a little bit on the spot there. And um, go ahead. No problem. No, no, everything fine. Okay. Um, uh, perhaps also taking a step back, but maybe moving a little bit closer again to the actual um, uh, day to day operations of um, IHE and how our, our member companies can plug into this. Um, Charles, I believe, and also uh, Tom mentioned the upcoming connectathons in in Northern Europe, uh, in North America, and also in Europe. Are these going to be still online events? And would you like to reflect on how um, some uh, some of our member companies would like to respond? It was it used to be that there were these um, VIP tours that people can go can can participate in uh, for the uh, in person connectathons, or they need to actually register. Is there something that in between, particularly when we move to online, how our member companies can actually um, see a little bit more what's happening and how they can engage with IEG? Uh, yes, let me answer that. Um, so um, the IEG European Connectathon was planned in November, March. Uh, 2020 in March 2020, sorry, uh, and we had to postpone uh, this face-to-face -face event um, and make it online. So we were very busy between March 2020 and November 2020, uh, recasting 20 years of experience and of tooling and scratching our head and wondering how we could make online um, a connectathon, which is essentially a, a learning experience, uh, a team building experience, breaking down the barriers between the vendors, the people, um, the users, uh, and a hands-on approach to interoperability. And making this online uh, is uh, far from being obvious. So what we were able to achieve in November, and that will be repeated and enhanced um, both in the USA in first week of March, and in Europe, the week of June 14th, um, is a, a, the, an online version of the Connectathon. And through the online version, um, you have the full testing experience, you have the full monitoring and support and feedback. So if you have a bug or something that does not work, you're not being told there is a bug, good luck. Um, you have people you can talk to and help you understand and fix and dive into the specification. So all of that learning uh, dimension um, is maintained. We are using a rather sophisticated um, a chat tool, much more sophisticated than the one we are using uh, in our everyday uh, interaction. It's called Rocket Chat. 
uh, and that tool has some integration with the with the testing tool uh, to start uh, interaction section between the people that are actually performing a test at a specific uh, at a specific point. We've been able to uh, achieve the rigor, uh, which is uh, you don't decide if you succeed or you fail. You provide the evidence of the testing that has been performed according to the IG provided test plan. Um, and it is, uh, there are neutral monitors that review this outcome and grant you the passing or failing uh, uh, grade. Um, and let's remember that the failing grade is never uh, definite. Um, it is delivered with the identification of the issue that you can fix and come back an hour later, a day later, or whatever uh, during that Connectathon week. So it's actually an improving Connectathon experience. The part that we've uh, found was very difficult to do was all of the um, uh, people networking, impromptu communication, uh, people from different company learning of each other, being able to talk about issue. Uh, that dimension, we've done some effort, we've had some, uh, some sessions, some discussion sessions, um, but we are still working on how to recreate the personal experience. I personally believe that we will never be able to recreate completely that personal experience, um, but we are trying to do it as best as possible. Um, we hope to be able to come back to face-to-face -face testing event, but this is not going to be the case in 2021. So both the US and the European Connectathon in March and June uh, will be held uh, what we call uh, online, um, and there are some processes to apply. Uh, the application of the US Connectathon is open today, you go to the IG USA website and you will find what's necessary to apply. There is still uh, room uh, and the capability to apply. And the application for the European Connectathon will happen, uh, will open uh, early in February uh, for the June 14 to 18 uh, event. Excellent. I want, I want maybe to add one component. Um, you can enter IG from two angle. You can enter IG from the back end if you want, from the on the testing side. And a connectathon is an open event. You pay a fee to help with the cost of the tools and of the organizing the testing. And that's uh, open to uh, to all of the vendors, all of the implementers, open source, commercial, whatever, uh, want to test an implementation. You can also enter IG through the other end that uh, Tom is uh, uh, managing, um, which are the uh, committee and domain committee that are defining the profile and maintaining the profile with the feedback they're getting for the implementers that are performing the testing. The testing is not only testing an implementation, it's the testing also the specification and making sure that the specification and the underlying standards are correct. So when we find bugs, we fix the specification and we go back to uh, if it's HL7 or IEEE and all of that, and we work with those standard body uh, so that there are correction and improvement made to those standards. So you are uh, uh, very welcome to enter from uh, either end. Uh, the only requirement to enter from the top end um, is to be uh, an IG member that has a very small fee. Uh, you need to be an IG international member. And the reason for that is that there is a non-disclosure and, and an IP uh, agreement that you must have um, that you uh, are going to uh, release any uh, uh, notify of any uh, IP that you may have um, on the work that is being done in those specification. We want to make sure we obtain, uh, we maintain those specification IP free and openly accessible. This is why there is this uh, uh, membership uh, uh, requirement and signature from your company. That's actually really interesting and really good uh, to know. And I'm not sure whether this knowledge has been universal or whether this has been as well advertised as it should be. I think this is really important. And maybe we, we include this in, as an, in an invitation when we send out the slides. Um, we have five minutes to go. And, I am, uh, uh, and I'm uh, conscious of the time. But I would like to give perhaps Petra or Tom one more chance 
to really reflect on the role of hymns over the years as an as an organization that's been kind of in a sense uh, starting these these types of initiatives Charles, you mentioned that um, I, uh, the, the, the kind of the founding role, so perhaps it was Alexander in hymns getting this started and um, perhaps reflect a little bit on the initiative, I think it's Global Initiative for Interoperability between IHE, hymns uh, uh, and HL7, uh, how you're driving globally the adoption of standards. So Petra, one more time. Thank you very much, Michael. Yes, um, I think I mean, what I tried to do in, in my short introduction is to say that these technical aspects are of course the, the core component but we actually do need to address some of the the wider political issues around driving interoperability whether that's things like ensuring that inter interoperability is always a core requirement in all public procurements or whether it's simply a matter of education of, of providing education for the whole of the um, purchasing spectrum so not just for the CIO but actually for the people who who are going to go to the CIO and say I want to have a device or a system that does XYZ and it's a little bit in the spirit of that that um, last year in fact it was it was almost exactly a year ago 27th of January last year uh, the the global consortium for e-health interoperability was announced and this is a, a, a cooperative agreement between HIMS, HL7 and IHE and it's really trying to do that it's 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 trying to marry up that uh, technical aspect with the wider political aspect and really trying to make sure that everybody globally can have access to the types of technology, the, the, the interoperability technology that will allow them to get the most out of the technology they've invested in. And in terms of sustainable and resilient healthcare systems, that's of course a really major issue because um, many hospitals have invested in, in very expensive equipment and use actually a, a fraction of its capacity because among other things, the interoperability issue hasn't been fully addressed. So that's one of the things that we will be seeking to do through that consortium. Um, but I do want to give the opportunity to Tom to say something further um, because he is far more deeply embedded in the technical side and I do recognise this as a technical audience. So Tom, if I could give the last word to you on behalf of, of HIMSS. Yes, thank you. Uh... So HIMS acquired the personal connected health lines, I don't know, two or three years ago. And we were real excited with that, with that happening because, as I mentioned, uh, the IEEE folks, or the, excuse me, the IHE folks, we, we tend to focus very much on the technology, which is very important. There's still work to be done there, but we do have solutions in place today. But HIMS has a number of communities, a much more broad uh, representation of the industry. And those are the people we need to talk to because what's missing is the mapping between what they envision is needed at a, in very practical terms and how we, man, how we map that to, uh, from, from that to a business case, whether that's a uh, return on investment or, or, investment or, or meeting uh, your, your citizen the obligations to citizens for healthcare and mapping that back to our profiles so we can see a very, very clear path to help them understand that, yes, these profiles are exactly what we need to solve a lot of our practical challenges. So. Pretty excited about that. Okay, I and think Michael, this, thank you from us both <laughs> for inviting us. Yes, yes, thank, thank you. you very much. I think this is a very nice and fitting end to this webinar. I think we're reaching the the, the top or the end of our ninety minutes that we had set ourselves as a as an appropriate time frame to cover the issues that we wanted to cover. I think um, uh, uh, many of the questions have have been uh, have been addressed and have been answered. We thank all of our. Um, uh, presenters, Alexander, Charles, um, Petra, Tom, uh, for, your, for your effort and for your contributions. To those of you who are still attending here, we are going to send a nice follow-up email with you uh, to you uh, where we're going to share with you the links um, to this um, slide deck and also the link to the recording of this. And we hope that um, this um, recording will get a whole lot wider audience when we put this into the public domain. Thank you to all of you, and with this, I would very much like to thank all of you for coming, and have a good day, and we hope that this has been helpful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. You too. Thanks. Bye-bye.